Hi, I'm Ken from Abora Finance. And I'm Deborah from the Property Frontline. You're with Property Myth Busters, and for the next few minutes, we're going to be discussing the topic of whether it's best to buy your home first or an investment property first. So let's kick it off. I'll just share my screen. So as with all of these decisions with property, uh, it will come down to quite a number of different pivot points and it will always depend on your situation. So when you're starting to think about whether you want to buy your home or investment first, you can look at a range of factors, uh, starting with how much money you actually have to to buy and so that would include things like your deposit and your borrowing capacity and we can we'll, uh, address that in a, in a moment. The other factor that will influence your decision making would be the type of asset you purchase. So for example, if you wanted to buy a home in Sydney or Melbourne, you would have to wait a longer time to build up a deposit to, to buy a property that was, say, a, a million dollars in your purchase rather than an investment property where you might be able to buy two for 400000 But if you're going to buy an investment property, you need to think about the rental returns on that property and also how quickly it will um, grow in capital growth. And then the other component that you need to think about is the current situation. Like what are you comfortable with? And you know, where are you in your purchase cycle? And what are your goals? But really from a numbers perspective, um, if you look at things dispassionately so from a numbers perspective it will normally be best to buy an investment property first because it will mean that you'll be able to enter the property market sooner and if you buy the right property that will mean that you will have the opportunity to buy in a place where there's going to be good capital growth. So you're building equity in a property just throughout ownership. If you buy an investment property and you're renting where you want to live, it means that you can usually live closer to work or if, you're, um, if you change jobs, you've got more flexibility in moving because it means that you won't have to sell your home and then buy something else that's closer to work, be able to build wealth as long as you've bought the right asset and you're getting a really good return and good capital growth. And you can use your investment purchase as leverage to buy your home next and it will give you more financial control because you'll have flexibility over what's happening with your money. Um, you also have suburb flexibility and by that I mean you can choose from a wider range of locations to actually buy and also where you want to live while you're renting. There are tax benefits in that I don't want to go into, into it in too much detail, but with renting, there's things like depreciation and also a range of other benefits where you'll be able to make claims to cover any costs that you have. Uh, the downside of buying an investment property first is that it kind of goes against current thinking. So usually when we're thinking about the property market, we're aiming to buy your home because you, when you reach retirement, you should really be owning a home to live in. Over time, and what our parents would have done would have always been focusing on 
buying a home first and they might never have bought any property to invest. But these days it is much more practical and achievable to actually buy a range of properties in different states in Australia. Also, some people think that rent, rent money is dead money, but then you'll also hear other people argue that paying uh, interest on a home loan can be dead money too, though you know, these days it's not as bad because interest rates are so low. Third factor is you don't own your home, so it means that if you're renting and the owner of the property wants to sell, it means that you'd be forced to leave. Um, and it also means that you can't, you know, knock down a wall or add a garage to where you're living. Once again, it really comes down to what's right for you and from a numbers perspective, what level that you can enter the market at. Thoughts on that, Ken? That's a good um, transition over. For me, in terms of um, answering the question of whether it's buying your uh, first home as your owner occupied first before doing an investment, I would say uh, it, it does come down to uh, your particular goals, your risk appetite, uh, and whether you're able to, to do that, which is the, the part that I'm going to you know, touch on a, a little bit more. Uh, it could be. It depends on what you know, you're wanting out of your purchase and also subsequent purchases, if, if that's the case. You know, thinking about a, a, a single person who may you know, enter a relationship, um, possibly have kids, um, you know, you, you're probably not going to buy a four-bedroom house straight off the bat. Um, so leaving room to grow and, and things like that do come into to the fact that if you're downsizing on the other side, but um, yeah, I guess it, it does depend on, on your circumstances. So um, to get into it, um, when I'm kind of faced with this question uh, with, a, with a client, the, the first thing comes to mind is, you know, what, what's, what are the options on the table? Um, because you might find that you can only purchase an investment property or you might find you can only buy an owner-occupied property or sometimes both or sometimes none. Uh, you're going to need to do more heavy lifting in terms of the savings and things like that or have uh, family help out in terms of guarantors and, and things like that. So that, that would be uh, my job in terms of working out what your financial position can support firstly um, and I wanted to just go drill down into like kind of the finer details to give examples I guess of how how it could play out that you know you can buy an investment property but you can't buy your own occupied but then the situation is reversed where you can only buy your own home and you're and, and can't afford an investment so um, usually when your borrowing capacity is quite tight um, it's, it's primarily linked around your borrowing capacity as opposed to how much savings you have uh, how much savings will affect either type of purchase. Uh, but with bottom capacity, um, it's it's common to think that, you know, if you're, if let's just say you're renting, so this is a renter paying 500 a week and they're buying an investment property for 500 a week. So in terms of whether they're buying or renting, the interest costs um, versus the uh, loan repayments versus the rental is the same. From the bank's perspective, although your you know cash flow is, is pretty much the same, um, when you're looking at you know, money flowing in and out from your bank account. But when the lenders decide what your borrowing capacity is, they actually don't take 100% of the rental income. They'll actually shade it by 20%. So they only take 80% um, mm. of, of your rental income. So 550, 80% uh, of that is 440. So they'll only include 440 rental income, but your, your rent is still stuck at 500. So that'll mean that your borrowing capacity will shrink slightly. Uh, compared to if you were to buy your own home, um, you're no longer paying rent, you're not getting income, but you know it does help on those marginal cases where you know it's touch and go with your buying capacity. Um, the other situation is so that's a situation where buying your own home probably um, could be on the table and investments out. The other situation could be you're renting, uh, you're living with parents um, sometimes lenders do have a minimum board amount that you need to pay regardless of whether you're paying something to your parents or not. Um, and then, yeah, looking at renting. So uh, when you're paying board, it's usually quite like a nominal figure, like let's just say 450 per month. It's, it's way less than if you were to actually rent. 
So if you were to buy your own place, um, you might find that you, the buying an investment property will actually have additional income coming in more than the 450 per month. Because I mean, if you're buying something for 350 per week, you know, in a month, that's, I don't know, very roughly 1,400, 1,500, to take 80% of that, um, it's still gonna be way more than 450. In that situation, you might find that your option to rent is actually, uh, uh, purchase an investment property is a go, whereas buying your own home is not because you're not getting that bump in the rental income. I mean, needless to say, I'll cover the other two just in case. Uh, if you have more than enough borrowing capacity um, and your savings amount um, is uh, decent, you'll find that you can go both. Situation where you can't do both is generally going to be hampered by your borrowing capacity or the amount of savings that you have um, or the LVR that you know, you're purchasing the property. The, those are generally the, the two problems that most first-home buyers have. Some other things to consider as well would be your, the grants that the governments are giving. So if, the, if you do buy an investment property, you're foregoing you know, first home owners grant potentially, depending on which state you are. I'm speaking about New South Wales being based in Sydney. Um, you might find that that's no longer, uh, that's off the table and you, know, you do have to pay the stamp duty in, included. Um, that could also affect whether that option is available to you or not. And, some, yeah, and it's a lifetime thing. So once you get it, generally speaking, you're not going to get it again unless you change the rules later. But as it stands, once you, you, know, you no longer qualify for it, it's gone. And then it's just thinking about your risk appetite. So I do have clients who prefer to just buy their own home um, and just pay down the loan, um, not really kind of looking into the investment portfolio side of things and looking at that maybe later on in life. Um, there's also your goals. Like I said, you know, a young family or someone who's single. Um, you know, you, you might be thinking of making some uh, sequential purchases down the track. I mean, if you're single and you're not sure where you want to live, you know, you might be considering a move to a different state um, or your employment is not really steady or whatever it might be, you're, wherever you are in your life cycle, you know, maybe buying an investment property makes more sense. Um, on the flip side of that, you could buy your own home and then turn it into an investment property. There's a whole bunch of variables that kind of come into to that and that and then that comes back to you know your goals what you're wanting to do what your next steps are after the purchase um and what your risk appetite is because some people do like to buy in the city that they are in um is that correct deb generally speaking yeah. your purchase is within uh something that you can see and check on uh check on drive past it. yep um funnily enough from what i've heard that generally doesn't happen um so then you know you start to get comfortable with buying place uh buying property um that have different um, opportunities in, in other areas of Australia. Mm. So those are some of the things to, to consider. So for me, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, being the money person, I'm pretty agnostic in terms of which way you go. It's more facilitating whether you can, you know, pursue a particular option or not. Um, so that's everything that I wanted to cover in terms of that topic. Deb, did you have anything extra to add or? No, I think it, it really does come down to, your personal situation and it is worthwhile putting effort into running through the different options before you take any action and you know, looking at it from a numbers perspective and then looking at it from all those other personal aspects that are important to you and then really it's up to each of us to make our own decisions um, from there. But um, what I would like to say is there's some information that we both have on our websites. So if you would like specific information in how to make this kind of decision, make sure that you absolutely do contact us. All right. Um, so thanks uh, heaps for watching. Uh, we love to receive your feedback. If you have any uh, please join the Property Mythbusters group and send us any questions or myths that you would like busted. You can also contact us directly through our company website and social media channels. Uh, you can contact Deborah on deborah at propertyfrontline.com.au uh, and myself, kenh at avora.com.au. Otherwise, have a fantastic day. Bye.